Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very exciting talk on how you can harness the power of robotic process automation for rapid deployment of machine learning models. I'm Miriam, um, and I'm a data scientist at Rogers. I work with Shahid and Gonzalo, um, and I help uh, make this like help them uh, working on this model. Um, our two speakers are going to be Gonzalo and Shahid Amlani. Um, Gonzalo Corrales is the Senior Director of Intelligent Automation at Rogers. His work focuses on identifying the business problems that can be solved through technologies like machine learning, intelligent automation, and others. As well, he understands the challenges in operationalizing those solutions, having deployed and implemented several of them in ways that deliver measurable financial results for organizations. Gonzalo holds a BSc in Electrical Engineering and an MBA from the Richard Ivey School of Business in Canada. Shahid is the Director of Machine Learning and Automation at Rogers. His work focuses on leveraging the power of machine learning to enhance the digital customer experience, solving problems for customers and deriving tangible results. Shahid has spent over a decade creating solutions that utilize the potential of technology and data to create real measurable business outcomes. He holds a degree in computer science from the University of Toronto and an MBA from the IV School of Business. Gonzalo will be discussing the key elements of how we leverage robotic process automation and Shahid will be walking us through the details of the model and some of the key considerations and challenges we face. I hope you all enjoy the talk. Gonzalo, over to you. Thank you very much, Mariam. So um, before I start, let me take a few seconds to thank uh, everybody who is attending this talk, and uh, obviously to thank uh, Dave Scarbach uh, for having the kindness to invite us to uh, deliver this uh, this presentation. Let me jump to uh, the first page in the in the presentation. Um, give me one second. Okay, perfect. We thought we would start by uh, setting up what is the problem that we're trying to solve. So the problem is as follows. For the last uh, 20 years or so, every time our company or uh, one of our customers would have an internet issue, an internet technical issue at home, the process would be as follows. Number one, the customer will fill the issue and normally he would pick up the phone and call us. This customer will go through an IVR uh, process and land with our technical specialist in technical support. At this point, the customer will have a troubleshooting discussion with, uh, with our specialist, and this can have three potential outcomes. First outcome is the problem is solved. Right there in the phone, we are able to solve the problem the customer had. But pretty often, also, there are two different options. One, we need to send a track to the customer's home because we have determined that there is an issue either with the wiring or the equipment in the customer's home. Another option is that when the customer was calling us the first time, we determined that this is not a one home problem. This is a neighborhood problem or what we call an area issue. In that case, we need to send a maintenance crew, which is going to go to verify that the network uh, laid out in the area is actually working fine. Over the years, though, we've also experienced uh, a certain number of repeat, or what we call a repeat rate. For a number of challenges that we have in, the, in our operations, there is a number of customers that even though they have gone through this process, they still need uh, find the need to call us again. So that happens both after the customer thinks the issue has been resolved at the time of troubleshooting over the phone, or sometimes, regrettably, also after he has received a visit of a technician or a maintenance crew has been sent. The challenges with this model are, are obvious. At the highest level, number one, it's a very reactive model. We expect the customer to work for us and act as a detection system. The customer is the one that is going to tell us that a problem is happening or not. So a very reactive system. Number two, it's very high in operational costs. 
uh, there is a very high uh, component in maintaining a call center to handle all the hundreds of, of thousands of calls that we receive every year. And at the same time, there is a high cost in maintaining the um, work, the field workforce of technicians that in our case uh, runs in the thousands. With these come the regular operational challenges that we have uh, managing such a large workforce. There is always attrition. There is always people leaving the company, new people coming into the company, the need for training for the new people coming into the company and so on, which results, as I mentioned before, in a certain level of repeat rate that uh, we can't avoid and we, we have not been able to avoid in our operations for the last 20 years. So this is the problem that we're tackling uh, with Shahid and I. And we said, okay, how, how can we make this better? How can we put this into the 21st century? So I'll, I'll, I'll move to the next page, Shahid. Thanks, Gonzalo. Um, before we just continue, Gonzalo, is it possible to make it full screen? We're getting a lot of uh, feedback in the in the comments that they can't see. If you can just will go, go into, into slideshow, that'd be awesome. Yep. Thanks. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, great. So when uh, Gonzalo approached me with this problem, um, essentially what we were looking to do was try to prevent customers from entering that, that funnel or that painful process that Gonzalo just walked us through. So we really sat down and we decided to approach the problem in, in three simple steps. Um, so since we're trying to prevent customers from entering that funnel, uh, the first step was really, could we build a machine learning model that would predict which customers were about to enter that funnel? So essentially, could we predict who was gonna have a technical issue? And if we were able to achieve that, if we were able to achieve number one, then number two would be, okay, we, we now know who these customers are, but what are we going to do about it? What can we do in order to prevent them from entering this funnel? And that's where we think that uh, RPA or robotic process automation is, is a, a key differentiator because it allows us to really execute and handle these predictions very quickly. And Gonzalo will go through that in more detail as we deep dive number two. And then the third step is really the outcome of this. So if we're successful at number one and we are successful at number two so we can determine the list and figure out what to do about it in a timely fashion then uh, the outcome will essentially be customers don't enter that funnel or customers don't feel the pain of a service disruption don't have to take time out of their days to call us and don't have to um, uh, have any negative customer experience and then from a business side of course we don't have to bear the cost or the uh, steps to actually fix those issues because we've already handled them. So, Gonzalo, if you want to go to the next slide. So, if we deep dive number one a little bit, um, so basically, what are the steps, what are the challenges that we faced as we went through and started developing and deploying this machine learning model to basically predict those customers that were going to come into the funnel? So, when we started on this journey, we looked across the many different data sets that we have at Rogers that were readily available to us for the most part. And this includes things like network telemetry data. So what kind of speeds are you getting? What's the quality of your signal? Equipment and usage data, what kind of modem do you have? Things like that. Um, all the way to geographic data. So kind of where is our cable footprint? Where are our customers clustered? What kind of wiring is it? We, 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 we took a wide lens to see what of this data do we actually think would be predictive? And over the course of the year, we had uh, many iterations of the model, and they ranged from, you know, depending where we were on the process, from considering 15 features to 50 features. Um, and right now, we've settled on a model that we're currently in POC with that considers approximately 40 different features. And these features range from looking at a customer's connection health uh, today or yesterday to considering kind of the patterns and the uh, the different metrics over a period of time, anywhere from 15 to 30 to 45 days. Now, from a training perspective, uh, we're currently looking at using about 15 million records. Uh, we're, we're, we're still working on optimizing this um, for both performance, runtime, and cost, um, but it seems to be working relatively well right now, and, and we'll continue to iterate on this to try to make it better. Um, now, when it comes into the actual modeling, um, this is a binary classification model. So we're basically taking our entire base and segmenting them into you know, who we predict is going to call and who we predict is not going to call. Um, we did start with a random forest model, but as you can see, we quickly moved to an XGBoost model to 
Um, and that was primarily to handle our imbalance data. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. Now, currently we're running this model daily. So we're, we're producing a list that uh, contains a list of who we think is gonna have a technical issue tomorrow. Uh, and we're passing that list over to RPA for actioning. Now, overall the modeling, you know, it's not super complicated, right? But over the past year, we've there's been a number of key considerations and decisions that we've had to make, uh, both from a machine learning perspective, as well as a business perspective. Uh, the first one that I'll kind of go through, uh, that's, that's probably one of the more impactful ones from a benefit realization perspective, is the recall versus precision trade-off that we needed to make. So we could either be really precise in our prediction of callers, but not capture a lot of them, or we could um, be wrong, like, this is, um, sacrifice some of this precision, um, but capture more of these callers. So in order to weight these things from a business perspective, we really needed to look at and determine internally kind of what was the cost of being wrong. So if we think about it, what was it, right? Um, if we had a wrong prediction and we included that prediction on the list, we would send that prediction to RPA. RPA would then determine why that customer is on the list and why we think they're going to call us with an issue tomorrow. And they would take the necessary action that they thought was required to prevent that customer from entering that funnel for, or from actually calling us. Now these actions, they can range from um, contacting the customer, booking a truck roll, rebooting their device, a whole host of things. And Gonzalo will get into more of the specifics. But the point being here is that that customer would be impacted. Like we, we, we may impact that customer with the action that we're taking in order to fix that problem. And in this case that we're talking about, because the prediction is an incorrect prediction, we'd be impacting that customer unnecessarily. So due to this, there's, there's some risk there, right? Um, there's a brand risk for Rogers. There's a, there's a cost impact of unnecessarily taking actions that we don't need to take. Uh, and there's also a customer experience risk. Uh, as, we, as we may interrupt a customer, we may contact a customer when we don't need to. So the approach we've decided to take is really to in the early stages, at least, weight precision significantly more heavily. Um, and as we start to see success as part of the action layer, uh, we'll slowly start to loosen the, loosen the constraints and, and, and see how the model performs. Now, the second key item that we faced is, is really focused around our entire data. Now, I won't go too much into data cleaning, just to say that it's it was probably one of the more time consuming and difficult parts um, due to the very nature of the data and the various systems it's coming from. If you have uh, questions or want more detail on that, feel free to ask in the, in the comments and I'll, I'll, I'll go deeper into it. But the more challenging item that we had, however, was, was really the, the handling of our vastly imbalanced data. Um, originally, we were testing on a balanced data set, and of course we were seeing wonderful results, but that's not even close to what reality is like. If you think about any big company, uh, like a telco or insurance company or a bank, anybody with several million customers, of that base of customers, only a small single digit percentage is really gonna call you on a given day. So what that does is it results in a very large class imbalance between your callers and your non-callers. Um, to handle this, we, we eventually migrated our model to an XG boost model. Um, and through um, painstaking hyperparameter tuning uh, and, and specifically leveraging some of the parameters with XG boost, like the scale POS weight parameter, we're, we're starting to see acceptable results for the call class and um, they were acceptable enough for us to start uh, the POC with Gonzal, and, and, and we've, we've got a, a use case out there that we're starting to see some promising uh, results on. Now, this, this continues to be a challenge for us, um, and we're continuing to optimize, but uh, right now we're pretty happy with where it's at. And the last piece that I'll just go through uh, is one of the more interesting learnings that came out for us uh, through our feature engineering steps. So when we originally started, we expected certain data points to be predictive um, that actually ended up not being so predictive in, in, in the first couple of rounds. So as an example, we, we expected intuitively that uh, the health of a customer's connection today uh, would be predictive. So if you had a poor connection today, we would expect that you're gonna call us, um, but it wasn't. And over some time, what we came to learn was it wasn't necessarily the, the raw score of the customer's health or the, the, the health of the connection in that moment, uh, but really, um, how that connection health compared to what the customer was used to. So we, we as a company have, have business metrics and thresholds to determine whether a connection is good or bad. But in reality, 
um, what's going to cause a customer to call us or cause a customer to have an issue isn't necessarily what we define as a threshold, but more what the customer is experiencing today versus what they're used to experiencing. So as we started to update these features and, and think about it in this way, we, they've, they've become significantly more important. And we're starting to apply that line of thinking to various business problems across the company now that we're trying to solve. Um, so overall, um, we, we're going to continue iterating on this model. Uh, we have aims to make it better, but we're very proud of where it is currently. Um, and as we, we produce those lists, we pass them on to RPA, and there's a whole action layer that uh, Gonzalo will take us through now. Okay, thank you, Shahid. So um, yes, um, once Shahid had the model to a level where um, we both sat in a room and discussed whether there was a business case here, when precision and recall were the levels that we said, okay, yes, even even uh, uh, considering the cost of being wrong on a certain percentage, we could still make this work from a business perspective. Then is when we actually uh, got into action on the on the RPA side. So our aim on the RPA side was to build some modules that were going to take the output of the machine learning model and actually do something with it, uh, put it in operations. So we get now uh, an output of the model on a daily basis. We get a prediction of which customers are we call, are we are, are going to be calling tomorrow with a technical issue. And when I say tomorrow, it's literally tomorrow. Right? So that uh, is then fed into uh, a number of RPA modules that we have built with our subject matter experts at Rogers. Uh, and those modules will run diagnostics on these customers that are in the list. These uh, different modules will zero in into a root cause or the most probable root cause. Once we get to an acceptable level of confidence that we have identified what the root cause is uh, for this customer to be experiencing a technical issue, we jump into action. That is then the, the action layer. And the action layer, we use robotics because it's a very flexible technology, but at the same robust enough that we can handle thousands of customers in this way. Uh, robotics, um, the robotics automations jump into action and trigger what the corrective action for such a problem would be. For example, if the problem is a results to be an area issue, if we run the diagnostic tools and we figure out that this customer is experiencing an area issue, he is going to call, but the problem is actually being experienced by all his neighbors around. If there is a group of 20 or 40 homes that are experiencing the same issue. So what we will do is we will definitely book a maintenance crew to go there in day so that we solve the issue before the customer calls us. But at the same time, we're going to use um, communication platforms like uh, SMS, emails, or even auto dialers to connect with the customer and let him know that, Mr. Customer, we have identified your experience in an issue, a technical issue, let give us the opportunity to fix it. We'll keep you informed through the process until the issue is fixed. Finally, the RPA will also log these um, actions uh, in a database that we have built, especially for this purpose, to make sure that the actions are logged, we track the resolution, we track the, the metrics and diagnostics and health uh, signal health levels uh, of our customers so that we verify and validate that the action that we took actually solved the problem. Of course, one of the key metrics that we track over here is how many of those customers that were on the list actually ended up calling, and we compare that with our baseline before. We are going to use this database that we built specifically for this purpose in a way that we are going to feed that back into the model and um, make the model better and more accurate. One of the biggest challenges that we have over here, of course, is that the model, the model, does, the model tells us who is going to call, but it doesn't tell us why for a number of limitations that Shahid will, will probably uh, comment uh, uh, somewhat in, the, in, in a second. What we want to use this data that we are collecting through this uh, action layer, uh, we want to fit it back into the model so that the model doesn't need the RPA to determine what the root cause is, but actually the model will tell me right away what the root cause is likely to be, and therefore it can jump even faster into action. Shahid, you want to take the last one? Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so as we've gone through this, uh, we've 
we've learned quite a bit. Um, so our next steps, and I see some of the questions kind of flooding into the chat a little bit um, around kind of root cause and things like that. So um, absolutely, uh, to a lot of the feedback that's in the in the chat, our next step is we really want to continue developing the root cause analysis for predicted callers. So as, as some of you have noted, um, right now we are really just predicting whether a customer is going to call or not call. We do have the aspirations to get to a point where uh, we can predict the reason for that call or basically why they're unhappy so that we can uh, short circuit some of this process so that we can action them faster and, and potentially actually fix the issue further upstream. Um, the reason for kind of doing it the way we are today is more focused around speed execution. So this was the kind of the fastest way we could do a POC, uh, but we do have aspirations to get there. So number one, we're absolutely going to continue developing the root cause analysis, both from an RPA perspective in the current function, but also from an and ML perspective, and that's number two, right? So we wanna to continue to evolve the model. So one, we wanna leverage the results from RPA. Um, so RPA is determining you know, why customers are calling and that's valuable information for us as we can use it to benefit the model over time. Um, and then there's other data sets within the company that uh, we have and that we have access to that we just haven't been able to incorporate for uh, a, a variety of reasons, but uh, there are some, some promising uh, items there that we are looking to uh, incorporate over the next over the next few quarters uh, and we're hoping to continue evolving this and expand this POC quite frankly from where it is today to uh, more broadly more broadly across the business anything else to add Gonzalo I think you covered it all if there is any questions from the audience great I think we have a couple of minutes yeah Miriam uh, any uh, questions that resonate There we go. Okay, Mike. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of questions on, uh, from the audience. Um, um, one question for uh, Shahid. Um, one question that I see that a lot of people are asking is about the environment and like what environment is Rogers uh, basically building this model on? Is it on-prem or is it cloud? Um, that would be a good time. Oh yeah, absolutely. So. Um, this specific model, so okay, let's let's go backwards a little bit. So Rogers, Rogers does um, have an on-prem environment, of course, um, and we use uh, a cloud environment for this machine learning. So we are doing this in AWS. Um, as, as a company, Rogers uh, utilizes both the major cloud providers. Um, but this specific model is um, built and deployed on AWS, uh, and we pass it back on-prem for Gonzalo to be able to actually action the, the predictions. We do have aspirations to, to change that in uh, the coming quarters, but that's the the current setup right now. And again, um, it's balancing off kind of te te technology trade offs and uh, speed execution. Thank you, uh, Gonzalo. There's a question for you about um, which RPA tools were actually leveraged, and then how widely was this model deployed in terms of Rogers customer areas? Yep. Okay, thank you for the question. Yes, so the, we, we Rogers uses a number of uh, uh, RPA technologies, but the main ones are uh, UiPath and Blue Prism. So um, both technologies were, were leveraged uh, to build this uh, this action layer. Today, we are this model is working across uh, all Ontario, which represents uh, pretty much uh, close to ninety percent of uh, the the Rogers customers. We expect to include the additional 10%, which uh, falls uh, outside Ontario and the Atlantic provinces, uh, probably in the next uh, six months. Thank you so much. Uh, Shahid, another question for you um, uh, around the model. Basically, some of the uh, audience, they want to know um, like an example of the most predictive features that you have in the model and then the current precision recall of the model. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, from a feature perspective, what we're doing is we're really, um, so the most predictive features of the model are, are essentially most of the network health features. So it's not super surprising. Um, and when I say network health, I mean, um, like what is a customer experiencing with their connection? So how fast is it? What's the quality of it? So things like uh, packet loss and, 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 and things of that nature. The other piece that's that's quite, um, I guess, intuitively predictive and, and, and shows up quite a bit uh, has to do with um, with Wi-Fi. So like we're all use Wi-Fi significantly a lot. And um, 
the signal strength coming into your home as well as the signal strength to your end user devices um, is definitely showing up very prevalent in the model. Um, and, and something interesting is just, you know, we started this model um, kind of pre-COVID and what we've seen is that the features that were important before COVID um, continue to be important after COVID. So it's still related to um, the quality of the connection, the quality of the Wi-Fi, how many devices are actually connected to the service, what kind of, of, um, what kind of usage the customer actually has. Uh, these are really bubbling up to the top. Um, and and like I was saying, we do have aspirations to uh, include additional data into that model. So we have we have some 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 better metrics that we can build in um, around the quality of the area. So not just the connection to the customer's house, but also the connection to the area and what what kind of the neighbors are feeling and things like that. And we think that'll help to better inform the model based on what we've seen so far. So. Pretty excited about that, and uh, hopefully that uh, improves the model over the next uh, few quarters. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're running out of time, but I'll ask just one more question um, from both of you, actually. Um, what was the most difficult roadblock that you had to overcome in order to actually deploy this uh, model at Badgers? You want to go first, Gonzalo? From the RPA perspective. Well, from the RPA perspective, I'd say that uh, um, building the RPA modules was uh, not definitely the challenge. Uh, uh, at Royers, we uh, I think we have um, uh, developed a, quite an expertise on on developing these kind of automations. We have around um, uh, 600 digital workers or virtual workers at this point in time. The biggest challenge was, uh, and Shahid kind of alluded to, uh, to that at a certain point, which was uh, the cybersecurity implications of transferring the data from uh, where the model, the ML model resides and runs every day uh, to uh, the environment where the RPA um, virtual machines are. So the cybersecurity implications of transferring uh, personal information, because we have identifiers of customer numbers and so on, I would say that was the main challenge on my side, which is um, not unusual for, uh, for the, the applications of RPA that we are uh, building these days. But I would say that was the, the, the one that took the, 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 the longest time. Shahid, on your side? Yeah, ab absolutely. So from a time perspective, like making sure data security, anonymizing data, all that kind of stuff is probably the longest pull from a from a time perspective. Um, from a, like a, well, I may not have taken the longest amount of time for, from my perspective, the biggest challenge we probably had was um, sourcing data, to be frank. And, and it doesn't sound like it's a difficult thing, but, um, you know, Rogers, along with a lot of, you know, big legacy companies has a lot of data that is fragmented across the company. So it's not stored in the central place and uh, identifying the data we needed wasn't super difficult, but actually going across into the different areas where it's stored, identifying where it lived and pulling that data into the environment in the way that we needed to was probably the most difficult. Um, there's a lot of different things to consider um, from a cybersecurity perspective, from a data aggregation perspective and that 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 took a while and it 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 really took it it really took a lot of thought across the company to figure out how we were going to aggregate this data in an intelligent way so that it wouldn't just be kind of one and done that we would be able to use this long term so uh it's it's, it's a work in progress but that's probably uh the biggest roadblock that we found and and uh, uh probably one of the biggest benefits that we'll have coming out of this because uh it'll make it easier for us to continue to build models like this and keep the point much um there are some other questions on the chat but unfortunately we are out of time uh i'm probably like um i'm sure that you can reach out and then ask questions if you would like after the session uh thank you so much uh, i hope you all enjoyed the talk it was really good and i enjoyed it thank you so much thanks everyone thank you everyone